Amen. Well, welcome to the 8 o'clock service. I'm Chaplain David Wake. I am not only your liturgist, but I'm also your preacher, so you get all of me this morning. I'm very excited to be here today. It is great to have you in the house of the Lord. We have a couple of announcements we want to let you know about. Uh, we certainly ask, if you're new to our congregation, that you have an opportunity to go through the, uh, the line, say hello and thank you. We have a fellowship afterwards. But uh, make sure you grab one of those swag bags that we put together so you get some nice uh, things. There's a connection card. If you would fill that out, give us some info on who you are. We'll welcome you to our community, and we thank you for being here. There is also the opportunity to take the Protestant education leadership training that's being conducted by our garrison chaplain, Chaplain Herb Franklin. That is going to be done on the 30th of September. Um, at 9.30 in the morning. The RSVP is due today. If you'd like to do so, uh, the email to Ms. Hygen is in the bulletin, so you can email and sign up for that. There is uh, food is provided, and so that's from 9.30 to 12.30 uh, on the 30th. And finally, this Wednesday night, the uh, family night begins 5.30 to 7.30. We have dinner, then they have some worship, and then there's great opportunity of Christian education, a number of different Bible studies for all ages. So come out to family night as we restart all of the fall activities. And uh, we'd love to be have, again, part of our family of faith. Hear this, the word of the Lord for our call to worship. The scripture declares, therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that in the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's taken from Philippians. Now, if you are able, I'll ask you to please stand, and we will sing together our opening hymn, which is number 10, Majesty. Number 10, Majesty. Please stand as we sing together. While you're standing, please take a moment and pass the peace of Christ to one another. Say hello to one another. Amen. Now, as you're seated, we will take an opportunity to say that great confession of the faith that many, many Christians throughout the ages have said to one another. It'll be found in your bulletin as well as on the screens as we recite together the Apostles' Creed. Christians, what do you believe? 
I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Now we'll take a moment of time for our confession of prayer. This will be an opportunity, I will take some silence that you can pray to God and to continue to work your faith through him. And then I will pray together and then we will continue. Let us go before the throne of grace. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended you and gone against your holy laws. We have left undone the things that we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done. And there is no health in us O oh Lord, have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us and those who confess their sins and our faults through Christ Jesus. Through your grace and through your love, we uphold what is given to us through the prophet Isaiah. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My whole being shall exalt in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robes of righteousness. We pray these things in the most merciful name of our Lord God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Now we can take a moment to sing another great hymn of the faith. So if you are able, please stand and sing together hymn number 45, Crown Him with Many Crowns. Crown Him with Many Crowns, hymn number 45.
to show our love and support of your gospel work, we pray that these gifts may be used to efficiently and effectively strengthen your church and reach the lost. We pray, amen. Please be seated. Please stand for the doxology. Today's scripture reading is taken from the book of Matthew, chapter 18, verses 21 through 35. It can be found on page 823 in the Pew Bibles. The parable of the unforgiving servant. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me? And I forgive him as many as seven times. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to the king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, 
his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. So the servant fell to his knees imploring him, have patience with me, I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when the same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, Pay what you owe me. So his servant fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what, he had take, what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading, hearing, and understanding of his word. Good morning, congregation. It's good to see you this morning. A Psalm of David, which has been a source of personal strength and comfort in what I believe to be previous perilous times and what I also believe are rather perilous times today. Again, it is a psalm of David. It is Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, and I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies, Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Let us pray. Let us now, church, pray in the presence of the Holy Spirit. Again, bow. let us bow our heads and humbly present our requests and petitions to the Lord. For all prayers of our congregation, those that are recorded, those personal and silent, those spoken and unspoken. For the chaplaincy and ministry here, and for the assistant, assist, 
Christine and Associate Ministries in the Fort Belvoir Chapel community. For the protection of all our service members and associated personnel, especially those in harm's way and for the provision of success in their missions. Provide peace and comfort to the sadness and grief of all bereaved families and friends. Comfort the sick and the ill on their sick beds, ease their sufferings and heal their ailments and sicknesses. Father, raise up servant leaders in all walks of life, in all professions, whether they be military or civilian, who serve in Jesus' name. Help them to work in humility. Make them selfless vessels of you in your image. Just as it says in your word, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. Remove them from any selfish desires. We pray these things in your name. Amen. And we'll end with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please, if you are able, let's stand and sing our hymn of thanksgiving, which is number 92. Oh, how I love Jesus. Number 92.
be seated. We are continuing in our series uh, following the readings of uh, the lectionary and picking up uh, where Chaplain Porter had about the, the stories of redemption and what Christ is teaching in his time on earth about redemption and how can we have redemption not only in with Christ and with the Father in heaven, but redemption with each other. How do we live in community? So I'll ask you to, again, open up your Bibles to Matthew chapter 18 as we're going to stair-step through uh, the great reading that we had today. But we have to have a little bit of a setup about that. I mean, there, it's in context of what Jesus has been preaching. He's already been talking about any number of issues that come up in life, whether it's temptation or, or those people who feel lost, as in the lost sheep. But then we come up against uh, what is life in our community. How is to deal with those in, in tension? Maybe a little bit of friction points. Maybe it's just a, we don't get along. How do, how do we deal with that? And I'm always reminded, and I don't know if any of you watch The Chosen uh, coming up on the next season now, it's a great way in which the media is representing that Christ himself walked and talked and just taught. And these are conversations. So when we read this, we should read this as that. A conversation. A teaching, yes, because there's many people there and they're all sitting there just waiting on bated breath. Just whatever you're going to say, Jesus, I want to hear it. But then there's these off conversations. It's kind of like getting the behind the scenes video and they start to talk amongst the disciples and the apostles are like, well, what exactly what were you trying to get at there, Jesus? And so there's some of that conversation. So we're going to read into this question mark of forgiveness and the biggest point of how do we forgive, but it starts with a friction point. It really does start with how do I get along with the people who I just don't get along with? So I'll ask you to take a look at just before our reading, Matthew 18, picking it up in verse 15. It's a, a, a teaching that he's given to all of the gathering, right? This is important stuff, and we use it here in the church as our guidelines with how to deal with people in tension. 1815, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen, then tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen to even the church, let, it, let him be to you as a Gentile or a tax collector. Truly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And I gave, again, I say to you, if two or more of agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or more are gathered in my name, there I am among them. Now, that's a great important setup for us because it's going to lead right into his then after conversation. But we should not forget the fact that there is a purpose in time to go to a brother to say you have wronged me, to, to lay down the facts, to do so in love and in grace. And that's going to come into our teaching. And that's what he's trying to get at. There is a new way of doing business. You don't have to do, remember in the day and the time of Hammurabi's law to have an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth and look for revenge or resentment or hold it over someone, there's going to be a new teaching. And his teaching is you go and you talk to someone one-on-one, -on -one, and if they believe you and they change, good for you. You have won a brother over. You have made it so that the community can live in harmony. And yet if it has to go to the next level and you bring some others or even to the leadership of the church, then do so with grace and with humility to work through the friction points of life. That doesn't always work out, and there is a consequence to people and their actions, and he even notes that. But the point is that two or three gathering together, there is unity in the body. That's where he's going after, that there's where Christ is. There is where God is unleashing the power of, of the world onto the world 
by coming together in unity. So now that's that teaching. That sets up our reading of the day. Then Peter came and said to him, I always have, Peter always has some other question, right? But let me get to the, the point. How often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times, Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times, which is our reading. Now I have to pause for a second and talk about, we are gonna get into forgiveness. And our framework in our family, Jennifer and I came along a long time ago with, uh, as you noticed, I'm in the media, I'm in the movies. And so we have a reference point that we use in our marriage and it's done pretty well. 32 years plus, stills going. If you wanna use it, go ahead, steal it. But when we talk about, we get into contentious conversations when we're not seeing eye to eye. And then we get to that point of unity, which he's talking about, coming together as two or three together and finding that part of resolution, redemption, forgiveness. Then we call it going to the warehouse, that we put something in the warehouse. Now, what do I mean by that? In the uh, first of the Indiana Jones, I know that they pulled Harrison Ford out for some really ridiculous Indiana Jones, but the very first one was the really best Indiana Jones movie, and The Search for the Holy Grail. No, the, the, the first one, the Raiders of the Lost Ark. Thank you. At the very end of the movie, if you could picture this with me, and I have an audience that I'm pretty sure was living in 1981, okay? So at the end of that movie, they have this thing where they put the Ark of the Covenant, all of the power that we've been displayed in this movie and the Ark of the Covenant into this chest, this crate. And then as Indy is trying to say, what are you gonna do with the Ark of the Covenant? A government man, we could also appreciate that. A government man that top people are, are taking care of it. Top, top, top people are taking care of the power of God on earth. And what they show visually is this, this crate is being wheeled into this massive warehouse and this guy's turning a corner to a bunch of other crates and it just has this feel of like it's just going into the abyss of storage in this crate in this warehouse and the all of power of God is just one little cube and a massive amount of storage in this government warehouse. So we use that because the idea of forgiveness is not just I forgive you. It's that you don't hold it over people, that you truly volitionally say, I'm not going to remember that wrong. You can never forget, really. It's not forgive and forget, it's forgive, and then work through your mind that you're going to put it, and we say, you put it in that warehouse. That you have a mental picture that you put it into that warehouse where there's just massive amounts of things I've done, and I know my warehouse is much bigger than Jennifer's warehouse, but when she puts it into that warehouse, it is so massive and so large that you just can't even imagine that you'd ever find it in that warehouse again. So that way, mentally and volitionally, in our conversations, we say, we put that in the warehouse. I forgive you. That's what you're supposed to do. That's forgiveness. That's very important. That's my framework. I want you to get that off the front. So let's go back to our text. When Peter asks the question, well, how often am I supposed to forgive somebody? Seven times, which sounds like a pretty good biblical number. I think Peter's kind of just throwing that out there, see if that, he'll, it'll bite. Seven sounds good. That's more than once. I'm, I know you're saying to forgive people and come together in unity, but okay, if he does it again, the same problem ever. We don't forget. If it happens again, you do it seven times. And then he says, no, 77 times. And for th those of you who, like me, grew up on the NIV, it was a 70 times seven, right? It was like even more. So there's seven, there's 77, and then there's 70 times seven or 490 times. Conceptually, what is Jesus trying to say? You're just supposed to keep doing it, right? I mean, if I went to 490 and, it's, and, and you said, I forgive you for something, and then you totally make the same mistake, they'd have to make the same mistake every two minutes just to get through a single day of 490 times that I forgive you, right? I mean, it. It is literally like saying you're supposed to continually forgive people. It's so massive a number, it's, it just goes out of your mind about that. That's how Jesus starts the whole discussion. With, it's not about just one time or seven times, it's about an attitude of forgiveness. It's bigger than you can imagine. So it's large, it's big. And they can't get that. You can almost 
imagine they have that deer in the headlights look, and he goes, all right, all right, all right. It's like the kingdom of heaven. I love it. He jumps into one of his parables. He says, it's, it's like the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is like this, a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants, and he began to settle, and he brought one to him that owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, the master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had for the payment. The servant fell on his knees and implored him, have patience with me, I will pay you everything. But out of pity for him, the master released him and forgave him the debt. So Jesus starts off with his now deeper understanding, his side conversation with the apostles, with this kingdom of heaven is like. And the kingdom of heaven is like all throughout Matthew. When he says that, he's saying not only here and now, the aspiration of what God wants his people to live like here and now as he's teaching and preaching, but it's also exactly what God envisions in heaven above. It's, it's the now and then. It is the way it's supposed to be. In our sin-filled land, we just don't have that. But that's what the kingdom of heaven is like. And he says it's this man who forgives the debts. Now, let's, because I work in the world of money in the current job that I have, I'm going to use the money part of this. I'm going to use the, the math that the, he goes. So he says that he has this servant who has a debt of 10,000 talents. Now, what is a talent in biblical times? Well, it's important because the second half of this has the denarii. So there's two different weight measurements. Now, weights are important here because there's a sense of the greatness of it, the, the gravity of the debt. But the weight here is a talent, which is literally the largest weight that they dealt with as far as bartering and trading and things like that. So what's a talent? Well, a talent, as it turns out, is about 6,000 denarii, which is good because we're going to be using denarii later on. 6,000 denarii. Well, what's a denarii? A denarii is nothing more than just like a little pebble. A denarii itself is like one-sixth of an ounce as far as weight. It's just a little pebble. It's the lowest denomination of coinage at the time. So think of that as the smallest, and we've got talent as the largest. So what does 10,000 talents come out to as far as, well, like I said, money? Well, if you have a sixth of an ounce of, is a denarii, and a talent is 6,000 uh, denarii, it kind of makes it a little simpler for us. And because it's done in silver, I decided I'd do a conversion for silver. So 6,000 denarii adds up to, for, for this amount is 10,000 denarii or 10,000 talents. If I had an ounce of silver, this is, here's where I did my math. If I had an ounce of silver, $23 an ounce, a talent comes out to $23,000 and then 10,000 talents turns out to $230 million is what this person. And by the way, this is when a million meant something, okay? So it's a little different back then, like 30 cents a gallon of gas, all right? It's like really serious money we're talking here. It's too big. It is too big an amount. It is literally the largest amount. That's why he goes to talents. We're talking big, 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 big. You can never ever overcome the debt in a lifetime. And the servant himself says that. I'll pay you back. Please have mercy on me. I'll pay you back. I'm like, there is no physical way you could ever, ever, ever do that. But the master does forgive him. Out of pity for him, the master leased him and forgave him the debt. He put it in the warehouse. He put it in the warehouse. That's amazing. To forgive someone's debt that they can never, ever repay, and yet he did so with just the cry of the heart. That is the salvation message that, he, that Jesus is trying to portray to everyone there in this deeper conversation with the apostles, who will be his evangelists of the future. It is a debt that you, no one can ever repay. Sin is a debt that no one can ever truly repay, and yet God repays it. The master 
his taking care of the debt. He put it in the warehouse. And in the case of God the Father, Psalm 103 says this, He puts our sins as far as from the east and the west, so far has He removed our transgressions from us. It's as if God puts it in that huge, massive warehouse and then forgets where the warehouse is. That's how much He loves us to forgive that debt. That's God's calculus. That's the way in which He does the math. Our problem is we live in a sinful world. This is the whole reason why He did the intro about how do you deal with people who have wronged you. We live in a sinful, the transgressions of this world. And so the other half of this story is about how the servant who's now been forgiven takes on that grace. How does he accept the grace? How does he action it that he's been given this great gift? Well, it says this, but that same servant went out found his fellow servants who owed him 100 denarii, seizing him, began to choke him, say, pay me what you owe. And the same servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience on me. But he refused and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. Okay, so I'm going to do the same calculus. We had 10,000 talents, $230 million. What would 100 denarii come out to be? Well, again, back to about an ounce-ish. Turns out that about 16 ounces comes up to all that we're talking about, which is $368. I mean, that's a rounding error in today's society. That's, not, that, that's something I can't even, I don't even worry about for certain people in life. Others, that's a lot of money, but in America, 368, really? You're gonna put, throw a guy in jail for $368? It's that small a debt. And yet, the, as by the law, because remember we talked about this, the Hammurabi style of eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, you know, an arm for an arm. Hey, 368 is 368. You owe it to the, the law is right. And they could adjudicate that law that way. That's the standard. It's unfortunate that we think of that because we do live in a world where people hold these things over us. They don't go to the warehouse very often, do we? The calculus is you never know when the other shoe is going to drop. You never know when someone's going to bring back something. It's the world in which we live. Why I think that's interesting is it's the lowest weight. He talked about the heaviest debt, the greatest thing you could ever imagine, 75, you know, 10,000 talents, and now he's talking just this minor weight of a denarii. In God's calculus, sin is sin. And he's ready to give away, grant to you redemption, love, grace, forgiveness for the, the most that you could ever imagine. We... Our calculus is we'll hold the littlest thing over people. We'll hold it and we'll go to the warehouse every single time that argument comes up. That's part of the challenges of marriage and friendships and whatever. We don't forget things. We do resent people. You know what it does? It's, it doesn't allow us to show the grace. For those who are believers in Christ Jesus, we've accepted the grace of the redemption of the Holy Father, but we don't show it to others. That's what this servant does. He doesn't demonstrate the grace that's been freely given to him. Why is it that we can't let that go? Why can't we do these things? It's not because God hasn't given us the Holy Spirit and the opportunity to give grace. Sometimes we just decide not to. It's part of the sanctification process. It's part of us learning to get from the heart and the head and to start getting into God's math. It's a challenge to us. We have to start giving to others. Look at what happens to this, this servant when that happens. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed and they reported to the master, the one who had provided the grace. The master summoned him and said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave all the debt that you pleaded with me and should not have you shown mercy to your fellow servant. Did you not display the grace? His anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay the debt. 
You see, because we're supposed to be forgiving others. We've been given this grace and the forgiveness of God. Now we should be showing it to others, and there is a price to pay. Now, I want to be very clear. This is not about losing salvation. This isn't, okay, I'm going to bring that debt back on. There are consequences to holding on to that grace within our community. It's about community at this point. This is not your right relationship with God. He forgives, and it said he put it into that warehouse that he even forgot what warehouse is at. But there's consequences to living in our life and times and holding resentment and holding on to the grace and not demonstrating to others around us. There's where God's light is not able to go forth. We are represented. We are those hands and those feet. Again, a, a media reference I'm reminded of. In Schindler's List, if you remember, Oscar Schindler continues to talk to one of the camp commanders. And he thinks his greatest power is life and death. I can hold it over people. In a moment's notice, I can take someone's life. Oscar tries to give him this idea. Well, if you were to pardon somebody, then there's some higher power. There's something that's even more visceral by the fact that you pardon. You know you have them dead to rights, so to speak, right? But you pardon them. There's where your true pardon is. And the camp commander tries it one time, and he kind of feels better about himself. Like, wow, I pardoned somebody. And he thinks of himself as a god, of course, in the movie. He doesn't do it for long, unfortunately. But Oscar's on to something. It's the forgiving that does have some power to it, that does truly change someone's life. Again, you have to remember, you don't go to the warehouse again. You can't go back and renege on your party. You can't renege on giving forgiveness. It's supposed to be done and done faithfully forever. That's what God did for us. When you accept the grace but withhold the grace, you only cause resentment, bitterness, hardness in the heart. But when you go around forgiving others and you put things in the warehouse, you get rid of the wrongs of life, there is freedom in that. And then you get to flow the grace from yourself. God has given us this power to forgive others. He says this, So also my, father, my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brothers from your heart. It's a volitional action. It's not something that comes naturally. It is literally doing God's work, which on this world is very hard to do. It is a daily grind. But I, there's such joy in it. There's such opportunity for the light to go forth and for God's message, His good message, the gospel message of redemption to go forward to the world. What more message do we need today than to hear that there is forgiveness in the world when today is all about holding over rights and wrongs and who, who did what last? What a great message we need. Sometimes we really need to believe that we are forgiven, that we don't have to worry about the $230 million debt, that we are forgiven forever. It's in the warehouse. My challenge to you is that you take that empowerment, you forgive those around you, you live a life of grace that is flowing from you so that God's will will be done and that God's love and forgiveness will be shown to the world that we have. The Word of the Lord. Well, I think a great hymn to finish this off with would be number 416, We're Marching to Zion. A great anthem of living a godly life. We're marching to Zion. Number 416, if you're able, please stand and sing together.
Amen. Well, I ask you to come and worship, uh, fellowship with us. We have uh, coffee to warm you up and to enjoy the time together. Please hear the benediction. May the God of hope fill you with joy and peace in believing and forgiving so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope and love. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Peace be with you.